The Unshackled Waves, episode 197. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. There's been some major developments in the international scene over the past week. Saudi Arabia, one of the most despotic nations in the world, is finally being subjected to international condemnation about its murder of a critic of their regime at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, Turkey. A 7,000 person strong migrant caravan is on its way from Central America to the United States, which we are told is spontaneous but coincidentally timed with the US midterm elections. The United States' weird relationship with Russia under President Trump has now taken another souring, with Trump announcing his intention to withdraw from the nuclear arms treaty due to uh, violations from Russia. To discuss these developments, I'm pleased to have back on the show the editor-at-large of The Unshackled, Steel Archer. Steel, good to have you back on the show. Nice to be back on TU Waves. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, now, there's been a lot happening in the, the international scene, so it's timely that we've got you back on. And probably the, the biggest international scandal is the assassination of uh, Saudi Arabian journalist Jamal uh, Khashoggi by his own government. He'd been working for the Washington Post after he uh, exiled himself from Saudi Arabia in September last year. He was a critic of Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and had also opposed the uh, Saudi intervention in Yemen, which they're fighting a proxy war with their uh, rival uh, for supremacy in the Middle East, uh, Iran, where they're uh, putting in a, a blockade which is basically starving uh, people there. Now, he entered the Saudi co consulate in Istanbul, T Turkey, to obtain divorce documents so he could marry his fiance on October 2, and he never came out. Now, Turkey, uh, all credit to them, uh, even though their president, Erdogan, is not a nice man himself, they, they were suspicious, and they eventually were able to inspect the Saudi consulate on October 15th, and they found that that inspection has been interfered with and we found out that a 15 member squad had tortured killed and chopped up uh, Gashoggi. they'd videotaped the whole thing and smuggled the tape out of the country as proof that the the mission was accomplished turkey uh, they charged 18 saudi officials including the 15 members of the the squad and it's fair to say that this uh brazen act of murder it's the height of arrogance from the saudi regime i mean this is a person who was uh, it was just somebody criticizing them which is i mean they should they shouldn't be that threatened and they go and create this major international incident absolutely tim it's been a crazy it's been a crazy uh, set of a set of events i've been following this one very very closely because this could have very deep uh, geopolitical ramifications, it could have very deep financial ramifications, it could have impacts with uh, Saudi Arabia's, you know, moral relationship with the world, with its relationship with Israel, with its relationship with Russia, with its relationship with Turkey. This could this could go a long way. Um, one of the very, uh, very quick things we've seen is, is uh, a prince is, he's a new prince off the block, he's, he's, he's He's trying to make a name for himself. So he launched this Davos in the desert and it's falling over. Everyone of significance, except for the Russians, has pulled out. Pakistan is still in. Uh, Pakistan, I mean, really? But um, yeah, so the, the, his, his plans and his ambitions are falling over because of this Jamal Kologi uh, scenario. And, and Mr. Kologi, he was, he was a, a, a fan, fascinating writer. Uh, for the Washington Post, and well, I've, been, I've been just I've just reading uh, the Washington Post just as the last couple of days has just published his final uh, his final uh, piece, and his final piece was actually really interesting because it it said it basically said that what the Arab world needs is a, a radio the equivalent to a radio free Europe, which was an anti propaganda uh, campaign piece. 
uh, against the Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War. The same thing with North Korea today, where we do littering campaigns and, pa and pamphlet and, pa uh, and pamphlet campaigns into the Korean uh, into the Korean dictatorship itself. So, Mr. Kologi, he was calling for education. He was calling for an anti-propaganda campaign. He was calling for all these things, and yet, at some, it's for some reason. Uh, the uh, Saudi regime has taken offense to this and they've gone and what it looks like, even despite, you know, Trump's uh, jimmying on both sides of this issue, he's, he's, uh, just, they've decided to most probably assassinate this man. There, there is another, there is a narrow, one other, one other scenario that could have played out. But most of the world thinks that this man was butchered, that he was cut up with a bone saw, and that he didn't get out of that consulate alive. Oh yeah, the the Saudi explanation is that there was a, a confrontation ensured and they accidentally killed him with 15 people. I mean, yeah, that happens at uh, consulates all the time. Yeah, and... there, there's always, there's always fistfights in consulates, don't worry. I've been mm. to plenty of consulates. There's always a fist fight, and someone always gets killed. It's no, it's no problem. And, and then, of course, to make sure that nobody f finds out about these uh, fist fights, then you uh, f to to make it look like that he's left. You get a body double to to walk out in a in a fake beard to make ma make it appear that it's business as usual. Mr. Trump, uh, the President Trump. He said it looks earlier in the piece, I think on the 11th or something, he said it looks like the worst cover up of all time. Some, some, some quote like that uh, to show you that even, even Donald Trump, in all of his wisdom on this, probably he's, he knows. He knows. The world knows. This is, a, this is a scenario that the Saudis are losing. They're losing the, they're losing the argument. Uh, the other thing you mentioned, which was interesting, Tim, is you mentioned that they had an audio and a videotape. Well, Turkey uh, says that they've lost that videotape, they've lost it, or but they still have the audio of that tape, and they're using it as sort of a nuclear button, a nuclear weapon over them in negotiations. So we'll see. The tape might emerge yet. Um, you know, might might have won some sort of deal or something might be going on. But uh, you know, I would, I would, uh, I would, I would, I wouldn't hedge that that the videotape and the audio tape are completely out of the picture yet. Uh, they might be holding it back, or they, you know, they might be using it as a negotiating tool. It, everyone has to is playing on this this absolute atrocious uh, tragedy. Uh, you know, Turkey, Russia, Saudis, America, every, it's a tragedy. But you know, this is exposing the regime for what it is, and. And, and the Saudis have been, you know, illegally occupying Yemen, blowing up schools, blowing up streets, blowing up hospitals, taking on them in, you know, using, using Yemen as a staging post and a training outpost for their war with Iran uh, for a long time now. And, you know, they're, they're being exposed for what they are. And, and I hope, I hope uh, the princes Davos in the desert uh, is it continues to be a spectacular failure you mentioned uh trump's quote there now uh this is well this is a scandal of trump's own doing but uh of course there's always the the pile on with uh president uh, trump's critics they're always on the the opposite side of president trump no matter what he does uh, he had uh been sending arms to saudi arabia worth uh, billions of billions of dollars uh he'd seen crown prince mohammed uh bin salman as an ally in the middle east there was even uh talk of him being a reformer because oh, he allowed women to drive i mean how progressive i mean uh, we're we're all too aware of uh, saudi arabia's human rights uh, abuses i mean they're governed by by sharia law women are still treated as second class citizens in a whole uh, host of other areas and uh, now trump had positioned himself as an anti uh, globalist that he was against the the influence of, of Islam yet he cuddles up to, to Saudi Arabia it was the first uh, international uh, visit that he that he made and 
uh, certainly his uh, supporters uh, weren't impressed. I remember Roger Stone saying when he got some sort of like necklace from a Saudi prince, he said, this photo makes me want to uh, puke. And it seemed to be that Trump uh, was doing was doing all this sucking up to Saudi Arabia. They also weren't covered by the Muslim travel ban. Uh, Saudi Arabia was not one of the countries mentioned. Uh, it seemed that Trump was only doing this uh, to basically placate the neocons who were worried that he was too anti-globalist. But now the neocons in Congress, they're finally talking tough on Saudi Arabia. Even Lindsey Graham, even in his regenerated uh, form, he, he's now beginning to talk about sanctions for Saudi Arabia and I just think that Trump now's the opportunity to basically show that you're not going to tolerate this Islamist regime uh, cut them loose I mean they've been getting away with this for for so long it's it's always infuriated me that this is probably the worst Middle Eastern country out of all of them in terms of uh, both uh, how they how they treat their citizens and also uh, how they're funding is Islamist extremism all around the world they're they're, they're considered our uh, great ally yet other countries like Iran are that they're, they're considered the devil I mean it, it's I mean I'm glad that uh, the tables have finally turned but phew, it took long enough yeah, it's the geopolitics, it's the financial politics that are behind it. They, unfortunately, the petrodollar system and the petrodollar cycle uh, means that in order for that system of money and credit to flow for the world reserve currency, the US dollar to remain the world reserve currency, America had to cuddle up to Saudi Arabia. Uh, they had to allow uh, you know, Wahhabism to basically spread throughout the Middle East and cause all chaos if they wanted, if they so wanted, because it, it, they could impact, impact the petrodollar cycle. Now, that wasn't the only thing. The petrodollar cycle was one, but the other one is obviously U.S. oil exports. Um, at the height of the Saudi, uh, the Saudi exporting, uh, you know, where, where America was importing, they were importing a, a thousand eight hundred something, eight hundred and forty-seven or some some region of U.S. Uh, of, of barrels per oil per day. So the uh, the American economy was addicted to cheap Saudi oil, to sweet crude, and, and others. And um, so, it, so coupled with money and with oil, uh, they, they couldn't do anything about it. So they had to maintain that sort of spuriously, as you mentioned quite well. I mean, the, the, every other aspect apart from the oil and money, they, they disagree on. They disagree on human rights. They disagree on uh, democracy. They disagree on uh, civil, you know, being civil to, 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 to uh, women and to minorities and to others. But uh, you know, yeah, and, and cultural differences and religion and everything. So, so these are not natural allies, but they're being penned together. They're being pulled together by unnatural forces, which were money and oil. Now, U.S. shale revolution has reversed that. The U.S. is becoming one of the biggest exporters of oil in the world, and they know no, they no longer need uh, Saudi crude. They don't. They, you, uh, Donald Trump said when he was running for president that the U.S. Uh, was in a big, um, ugly bubble. It was a big, fat, ugly bubble. That was what he was talking about the stocks. He was talking about the U.S. dollar, and he was talking about basically everything to do with what America is at the moment, which means that in his heart of heart, he's a dollar bet, which means he's a, which means he knows the scenario. So, you know, they can cut Saudi Arabia out, and I think they might be looking at that. Trump has also exposed <clears throat> the sneaky, what the York, New York Times is calling the sneaky relationship between Saudi Arabia and Israel, because if you look at any diplomatic channels, there are no diplomatic, there is not an official relationship between Israel and Saudi Arabia. There is no, there is no official relationship. But Trump has been saying, he, he said, I think last night or, or the day before, uh, that um, that the Saudi Arabia has been helping the United States paying for many things and helping them with the Israeli relationship. Okay, so he's exposing that that Israel and that Saudi Arabia have been working together against Iran, against Yemen, against Iraq, uh, against Turkey, which is a NATO ally against Egypt, you know, uh, and that was especially harmful to Barack Obama, who was trying to install the Muslim Brotherhood, which was a more secular 
uh, uh, um, uh, regime uh, to help quell the, uh, the, the the instigation of the the Arab uh, crisis uh, with the Arab Spring. So um, you know, so so Saudi Arabia, as you as you rightly mentioned, religiously, culturally, politically, everything, uh, racially, uh, on every spectrum, they're completely opposite. But because of the dynamics of the petrodollar cycle, the cheap oil exports, they couldn't do anything about it. And the fact that the 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 the, the, the families in Saudi Arabia have put most of their money in New York banks and Goldman Sachs banks and and others, um, they they sort of hold a tether over the U.S. stock market, over the U.S. bond market, and they always threaten. That's the first thing they do whenever America America doesn't do what they want. They always threaten to stop their oil. But America, because of the U.S. shale revolution, because of these other things, America no longer needs Saudi Arabia. And America no longer wants Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is being cut loose like the uh, decayed limb it is. And uh, this might be the the, uh, the opening. Remember, if you remember that uh, President Trump said in his inaugural speech, he said we're going to eliminate radical Islamic terrorism. Now, he, he didn't obviously go after um, he didn't obviously go after Saudi Arabia uh, because he didn't class them as radical Islamic terrorists. He, he went out and destroyed ISIS first, which is actually what he promised in his campaign earlier in the Republican debate. He said, we've got to destroy ISIS. And then when he went to inaugural, he said radical Islamic terrorism. So what did he do? He went straight after ISIS. So he went after ISIS. Then he, moved, he went straight to Saudis. He made them pay for uh, arms products. But then the U.S. dollar has been going up, which means the, those arms deals are going up. They're not; they're costing Saudi Arabia more than that they can afford. So if they cut them out now, it'll be a great move. It'll make the region safer. Well, like I said before, I mean, it took uh, the rest of the international community uh, long enough to, to to wake up to Saudi Arabia. But because of those issues that you mentioned, it, it's now that well. Uh, pr uh, probably not for entirely the the right reasons the the international community now feels it can cut Saudi Arabia loose there's still uh, a lot to unfold uh, with this uh, scandal but it's clear that uh, well it's not just the the United States which is putting pressure on Saudi Arabia it's countries like Germany they've already halted their arms exports to, to Saudi Arabia there's still a lot of uh, fallout to, to, to come but it's still I'll bet this is a horrific barbaric murder at least mm. it's had uh, this this type of, of silver lining you mentioned it's horrific and barbaric, and we have to call this out. It's, this was a man who is allegedly being chopped up with a saw of some sort. The 15-man hit squad, um, the 15-man hit squad had someone who was a autopsy a specialist. You know, this is this is absolutely horrific. This is this is nuts. And he was writing, you know, he's been right. He's been writing about Arab freedom. You know, pan-Arabism, Arab freedom. And, and, and that they need education and that they need to be aware of the political political world. And, and considering Arab demographics, where they have a whole bunch of youth, and we, we have felt a little explosion of that in the Arab Spring. They have a, a, an abundance of youth, which even 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 the Australian patriots, the American patriots, uh, you know, the, the anti-Islam uh, people, uh, they would rather an educated population than a, a dumbed-down, uh, violent uh, one. Because the, the dumbed-down, violent uh, um, youth demographic is more dangerous to Europe, is more dangerous to the United States, is more dangerous to Western countries. Um, because they'll just simply do what their imams tell them. If they have reading skills and writing skills, at least they'll probably be able to be productive in their own countries more so. They won't rely uh, on just taking information in from the imams and doing harm to Western nations. So you, you, you probably want to go and mis read Mr. Kologi's work and find out why Saudi Arabia is so upset with him. One of the, the other major international stories this past week has been what is termed the migrant uh, caravan through Central America, and now it's in Mexico now. 7,000 
uh, migrants uh, from uh, Central America. They've, they've come from uh, countries such as Guatemala, uh, El Salvador, and Honduras. They're, they're planning to march on the, the U.S. Uh, border to uh, try and see if they can enter the United States. Now, when I read this, it just seemed too much of a coincidence that there's all these migrants coming from Central America to go to the United States when well, the border wall is, is not up yet and when it's the, the midterm uh, elections. Now, yeah, it just, it just seems too coincidence that it's called a spontaneous uh, ca caravan, this uh, swarm of, of people, but there, this, this, this operation couldn't have been put together just spontaneously. There would be organizers assisting them all the way, providing accommodation, uh, amenities. And uh, uh, the, the irony is, uh, supposedly Trump has made the United States such a horrible place to live. Remember all those celebrities who said they were going to leave America if Trump was elected? You know, despite that, uh, as the expression goes, literally Hitler is in charge of the United States, all these migrants from Central America, they're still wanting to go. Yeah, you're exactly right there, Tim. This is a very interesting story. Uh, you know, some some mainstream elements are saying, you know, like you said, 7,000 strong. But if you look at the footage, it looks a lot more than 7,000. These, these, this caravan goes on for a long time. I've seen some alternatives talking numbers as high. Uh, on the maximum end, is 50,000. On the minimum end, uh, 2,000. And in the mainstream, 7,000. So we're talking about somewhere between 7,000 and 50,000 people. Who are streaming from these 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 countries where there is no President Trump? Trump doesn't exist there, and they're going towards President Trump. How does that even make sense? Huh? Tell me about that. Because isn't isn't America a white racist country with the worst president in the whole wide world? With the orange man, he rules everything. He's ruling everything, and they're going towards him like a magnet. Hey, that doesn't make sense to me. One, one of the one of the deep one of the deep things behind this is remittance payments. So um, Trump Trump has been clamping down on re remittance payments uh, because remittance payments, for example, Honduras make up really big uh, large chunks of their economy. Okay, and um, and so tr Trump has said, well, you know what? If you if you make if you make uh, money in, in America. Uh, and you and you send it home. You know you're going to have to pay tax on that. You're going to have to pay duties and fees and taxes like everyone else. You're going to have to uh, pay pay uh, wages uh, income income tax to the IRS on those wages. And that big agriculture can stop just importing these people on mass and importing them to use as agricultural labor. So a lot of these people have had to get registered. They've had to you know they've had to. You know, do we go through the motions? A lot of them would get deported and come back, and all this sort of stuff. But remittance payments, because of because of Trump's crackdown on a lot of this, has fallen through the floor. And a lot of these economies who are supported, sometimes huge percentages of their economies are supported by remittance payments, have fallen through the floor. So they're they're all marching up. Um, it's kind of it's kind of interesting because. Uh, the the other the other player behind the scenes that people don't know about or don't talk about is actually the United Nations. Um, the United Nations has been really uh, been really quite uh, an advocate of um, been really quite an advocate of creating policies that encourage these countries to to uh, to to push their people out. Uh, and, and, and also the United Nations is pushing Pit Nieto, which is the uh, Mexican president, to open up those borders and allow those, these caravans through from those Central American countries. So the United Nations, uh, yeah, there's a little bit by Trump through there with the remittances, but the United Nations has been one of the main players and the main advocates of getting these people together and pushing them up. Uh, and, and, and you could probably... Uh, push the United Nations back and say, well, who's who's one of the big guys in the United Nations? It's the Clinton mob, it's the Hillary, it's the it's the Clinton Foundation, it's the George Soros, it's the globalists. It's the same players that we always find um, going around. But you know, if if these countries they have to they have to um, 
uh, they, you know, the blue wave thing is a legitimate, absolutely legitimate argument. This is the other one, which is the midterm one, which is that a lot of they're heading towards states where you don't need voter ID. Trump's trying to push for voter ID. The uh, Democrats are trying to get a blue wave going for the midterms. It's not happening. So they need more people. And of course, it's always the onus is on countries such as the United States to accept these people and they're their responsibility, but it's never uh, the responsibility of these Central American countries to make their pla uh, uh, to, to make it better places to live for these people so they don't flee. It says that these uh, migrants, they're, they're fleeing these Central American countries because of uh, crime, uh, poverty, and corruption and violence. Uh, well, that is, I, I'd say, an indictment on the governments of those countries and not on on the United States for not uh, not wanting these sorts of things to spill over into, in, into their country. I mean... Why, why isn't the international community saying to these nations, hey, you know, you better get your, clean up your nations. I mean, look at all the people exiting. Do you hear that, Tim? That's the sound of a thousand lefties saying that this was a CIA j job. Yeah, lots, of, lots of lefties come back with this argument that they say, oh, these, this isn't, this isn't uh, the United States problem. It's a CIA hit job. They, they, the CIA comes down to Central America or South America, they overthrow their government, they cause all this chaos, and then they leave. Like, there's a very stupid <laughs> argument, it's a dumb argument. I, they I, always I, say this. I wish the CIA had overthrown the Venezuelan government. I mean, that would actually save the country. Remember, it's Yankee doodle, doodle imperialism, so they're going to leave those people. If those people starve to death, oh, we didn't do it. Venezuela under Hugo Chavez was a fairly rich country, okay? It was a fairly rich country, and it's gone downhill since the adoption of mass socialism. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, not that Hugo wasn't a mass socialist. He was a socialist, but you know, he, redirect, he, he redirected resources at least to the, 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 the poorer classes. But anyway, and they, you know, Venezuela is a whole other topic. But well, sort of. But anyway, like the, these these lefties, they love to say, well, it's the CIA's fault for coming down. The CIA always does a hit piece on these countries. They cause chaos, and then it goes up. It's not true. None of it's true. These countries can't get their act together. They they can't stop having military coups. They can't stop these power struggles. They can't. They can't get their manufacturing in order. They can't get their agriculture in order. The import-export environment in order. They, th these are these are problems and symptoms of their own national governments. And it's not up to the United States to come down and fix it every single time. It's not up to them. So what are they doing? They're exporting their problem from where they are. And they're saying, you deal with this, United States. See all these people we can't look after ourselves because we have no idea how to actually run a country and leave us alone if, if you come. Or, you know, if you don't come, we'll send our people to you to, to, to push on. This has been half a century. We've been through this for half a century. This country is not doing it for themselves, not, not, not being bastions of stability. And the West is getting sick of it. You know, there's American memes out there who are running around saying, shoot them at the border. You know, I, I'm not saying that this, this is, you know, Amer Texans will do what Texans do. Yeah, if the the NGOs who are helping to assist this uh, caravan, if they if they think that uh, this is a good strategy uh, to try and wedge Trump in the midterm uh, elections, then it's going to backfire spectacularly. I mean, what uh, do they not realize on what platform that Trump was elected president? It was stopping illegal immigration from Mexico. If you send a whole bunch of immigrants in time for the election, and Trump says, "I don't want them." to enter the United States, uh, don't you think that the people who voted for him two years ago are going to come come out and vote the same way again? Well, you know, he just deployed the N-word. Have you heard about that, Tim, where he's used, now he's used the N-word? The N-word is not the pejorative for uh, uh, African-American, but it's now 
nationalist. Oh, Trump has used the word nationalist. He's a nationalist. He actually cares about the United States, which means that he's probably going to do something about this migrant caravan because you know what? This migrant caravan is not in the favor of the United States. It's not in the favor of their national interests. Oh, it's the N word. Oh, oh, oh. It's exciting times we live in. A president who actually cares about his own country. Whoa. Another issue that uh, President Trump has uh, raised uh, recently is that of the uh, nuclear treaty that the United States has with Russia, uh, the, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, or INF, that was signed way back in 1987 by US President Ronald Reagan and Soviet President Mac Mikhail Gorbachev. Now, uh, Trump has claimed that Russia, with their most recent deployment of missiles, has uh, violated this treaty and says that it's justification to uh, uh, to withdraw from it. Uh, now, Trump has always had an interesting relationship with Russia during his uh, presidency, to uh, put it uh, simply. Uh, but what is Trump up to here? Why, why all of a sudden is he raising this uh, treaty and, again, uh, talking tough on Russia? I love this move. This is absolutely fascinating, and this is fantastic. So basically, Bolton is right on this, and you're not going to hear this from a lot of the mainstream media. A lot of the mainstream media is going to pump up this notion that the U.S. is wrong, that we're starting a whole new Cold War again, and that it's all going to go, and we're all going to be left, you know, drinking radiation soup at the end of this. This is not how it's going to end up. What this is, is there's a couple of forces at play here, and this is extremely timely and and, and strategic and grand. You know, you know, during the campaign, Donald Trump said, "Don't use the word mastermind for the for the for the criminals." Well, I'm going to say Trump is using mastermind tactics here against Russia, and I am probably one of the most pro-Russian commentators on the alternative media. Uh, you, you can vouch for that. Anyone who knows me can vouch for that. Look back at my writings. I'm very pro-Russia, but I'm also very pro-United States as well. I'm not, you know, pro-West. You know, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say, you know, let's Russia's the big bad guy and all this, and you know, Russia needs to be punished and have sanctions and, and all that stuff. I don't. I, don't well, I want the best for the United States. I don't want the best for Russia. That's how it goes. But what what he's doing here is very interesting because. The world is becoming multipolar. The world is breaking up. The, the world is, the regions are rising, states are rising, things are happening. And basically, Russia has been violating this treaty over and over and over again. Obama admitted it in 2013. And, uh, and, and since the end of the Soviet Union, Russia has had no ability to, uh, to, to go back on its old Soviet technology and utilize and use that. Um, so Russia has been blatantly uh, violating this treaty, as it has violated other treaties. America has been playing by the rules down the straight narrow on this, but people and, and, and countries that aren't party to this, like China, for example, or like India or, or Pakistan um, and, and the, uh, the, uh, the invisible man himself, Israel, who doesn't admit they have nuclear weapons, but probably has about 200 nuclear weapons. They all have been developing these technologies independently and indigenously. I mean, just look at North Korea. I mean, they're the ones who blatantly did it out in the open and look what happened to them. Nothing. And just, <laughs> well, they're, they're the actual, they're the other one as well uh, we have to talk about in this scenario. But, the, but what's happening with Russia is Russia in its demographics, it's, uh, it's a demographic argument. Russia's technical uh, techni technical uh, ability, its technical engineers, its host of technical en engineers, are uh, averaging 58 years old this year, going on 59. 59 is the average death age of Russian males in in Russia. So they're all about to die. All of the all of the, all of the uh, technical engineering class of Russian of the Russia uh, is about to pass away. And they're going to take with them all the knowledge of uh, of intercontinental ballistic missiles, of medium range ballistic missiles, of nuclear power plants, of of roads, of architecture, of everything. Um, the the Russian economy 
and the ability to adapt um, post-Soviet Union was not very good. And those people are about to pass away. So you're going to watch Russia in the next next 10 years at least struggle with its domestic infrastructure like you won't believe because they don't have any more technical staff. So if you look at what Nixon did when he launched the Star Wars project, which Trump already did with the Space Force, where he's, he's reinvesting a whole new uh, armament range in space. So Trump copied this is copied Nixon's Star Wars project with the Space Force and now he's withdrawing from this treaty with Russia because the Russian engineering class is about to die and pass away and move on so Russia will be left with a giant hole that it can't fill so it can't compete in this arm race so Russia is out of the game so now now they can turn around and they can compete with China, they can compete with India, they can compete with Pakistan, they compete with Israel, they can compete with all these other countries because Russia is out of the game, it's gone. And that treaty, which John Bolton is so perfectly right on, which is why uh, is, is why they're going to withdraw. And, and, and Putin said uh, in his quote, his, his, his quote, he said, the, the eagle holding the branches, you know, the US emblem, uh, did 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 it eat all the all the uh, all the arrows and it did it eat all the olives? And Bolton said, "I didn't bring any olives. He didn't bring any piecemeal because Russia's gone. Russia's finished. So Russia is over. It's China. It's India. It's these other states that they have to worry about now. And it's a masterful, masterful stroke by by President Trump." And it's one that's going to go down in the history books. It's one of the greatest strategic moves of all time. Uh, for what it's worth, I think that these arms reduction treaties, I mean, they, they basically violate the, the, the principle of national self-defense. I mean, in the Cold War, everyone was scared of, all, of the, the Soviet Union and the United States having all these nuclear weapons. But... Mutually assured destruction, it worked. I mean, every both nations were, were armed to the teeth, but there was not a nuclear war. There's never been a nuclear war. And so it seemed that the fact that both countries could uh, destroy each other, yes, there were uh, some close calls, but it seemed to work. There's never been a world war since that basically that these arms arms reduction agreements i mean they're basically done on on good faith i mean international agreements i mean let's be frank here they're not worth the paper they're they're written on i mean who's going to actually uh enforce them what are you going to get some sanction from the the un security council oh so terrifying i i didn't even realize that this arms arms reductions treaty was still uh, a sticking point i mean all nations they have their their nuclear arsenals still uh, i i think that's just the way that it's it's going to be and like i like i just said it appears to maintain international order this treaty was a shackle this treaty was a shrack shackle around the, the 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 legs of the american eagle and it's been broken uh it's a masterful stroke i i i agree i think i think that I think that nuclear weapons are, are, are an old uh, were, the, were an old warfare mechanism anyway. Um, after Nagasaki, we're not going to have a nuclear war anymore. There is a taboo against using nuclear weapons. So I see nuclear weapons as a very old weapon, old technology. Uh, you know, America has by far the dominant uh, advantages in this in this arena. You know, they have enough fissile fissile material to last generations um you know they have enough expertise um they're, they're completely nuclear latent they have the rocket technology they have all of that and uh, and most of these other countries don't uh, russia was about to lose it north korea was only using it as a mechanism to gain what they wanted out of the international community whether that was economic or, or military or, or foreign aid or whatever Pakistan is your rogue state. Pakistan can't be trusted. Pakistan would use uh, those and other some other Middle Eastern countries who who, who get very tense. The uh, the economy has been the, the and financial markets have been the latest route of nuclear weapons, uh, where they've always threatened to press the big the big red button at the Fed and crash the economy if if they didn't get their way. So that's been the the cloud we've been hanging over 
uh, the early part of the 20th, 21st century, when most people think it's terrorism, but it hasn't really been. It's been the stock market. But we're even moving away from that now as AI has taken over, and AI is becoming the new dragon in the dead and in, in the den. And and I I think there could be a room for international cooperation on AI. I think people are worried about AI uh, with jobs and other things like that, uh, jobs and automation and things. Uh, and also with artificial intelligence for running rogue, you know, Terminator stuff. So you know, AI is the is the new big one. Uh, but I, I think I think this is a genius move from from President Trump to remove us, uh, remove the U.S. from the intermediate range nuclear forces treaty. And of course, Russia has responded by saying, "Oh, Trump is only uh, uh, courting this uh, international condemnation because he wants to position the, the U.S. in a position of uh, of military strength again, which is right." But he's he's kind of implying that, "Oh, you're just bashing Russia because uh, uh, you want to please a, a whole bunch of people," implying that uh, that's why you condemned our uh, conduct in in Syria and why you uh, now and now claim that uh, we interfered in the 2016 elections. Yeah, so the, the US media, the mainstream media, the CNNs, MSNBC type uh, media, uh, they, you, you can, the one thing you have to learn is you can't please them, okay? When they're in power, uh, you can't please them. When they're out of power, you can't please them. So there's no, there's no real point um, kowtowing because, you know, on one hand, they hate Russia, hate Russia, want to destroy Russia, want nuclear war with Russia, you know, want, want to, you know, what Hillary Clinton said, any cyber attack, you know, we will treat with nuclear retaliation, all this sort of stuff. They want a nuclear war with Russia. On the other hand, Bernie Sanders goes and has his anniversary in Moscow because he's a communist, uh, you know, so you can't please them. They're, they're, they're a destructive cult and uh, it, it would be best to stay far, far away. Unfortunately, we can't do that. We have to all live in the same world as, as, as them. So you have to manage them, and, and, and this is how you manage them. Well, it's been a fascinating uh, discussion uh, today, Steele. It's, it's been good to digest uh, all of this with you, with your uh, expertise. And uh, whenever the, the international world is uh, uh, the, the talk of uh, the mainstream media again, I'll, I'll love to have you back on. Thank you very much, Tim, and thanks for having me on. And, and it's a great show, and you've had some excellent guests, and I've been watching fervently. And I hope the, uh, the audience over there at the Unshackled, uh, you know, helps you out and and and, and continues to uh, you know progress towards this 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 change that can be made with alternative voices. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. We've still got many exciting events coming up before year's end. Gavin McGuinness, internet television personality and founder of the Proud Boys, is touring Australia this November. Australia's left are attempting to get him banned from Australia for being the alt-right leader of a violent street gang, but we'll see about that. All going to plan, he will have shows in Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth. He's being hosted by Penthouse Australia and you can book your place, including various VIP passes, by going to Gavin live.com.au. The Victorian state election is being held on Saturday the 24th of November. I'm pleased to confirm the Unshackled will be having another election night live stream starting at 6pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time when the polls close. Join me on Facebook and YouTube Live along with my panel which will be the Young Conservative, David Hiscock from XYZ and Magnus O'Mallon. If you want to take a stand against Antifa violence and intimidation, there is another free speech rally happening in Melbourne, hosted by the Australian Free Freedom of Speech Movement, which will be on Saturday the 1st of December at 12pm in the Melbourne CBD. Also, as always, remember we cannot do this without your support, and the best form of support is always becoming a patron of The Unshackled over at patreon.com slash The Unshackled, or like many of you have been doing recently, send us a direct contribution via our PayPal link, which is paypal.me slash The Unshackled, which all goes a long way. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.